So guys, are we ready to get rolling? We're ready. All yeah. righty, let's get this uh, party started. Welcome to the smartest people in the room. We are so glad you are here with us and just by showing up, you are already demonstrating your very own smarts. Today, we are pleased to bring back a great friend of this platform and she is bringing a true living legend of the radio industry with her. Believe me, you are in for a real treat today. Before I get started, let me take care of some business. First, to the audience, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat window. The reason we do these webinars is twofold. First, we want to showcase really smart people and the amazing work they do day to day in the music industry. But the second reason is a bit more nuanced. Many of you know that I am a music industry headhunter. I place music executives in roles throughout the industry. So by definition and function, I help people connect with companies. In this series, my goal is to help you make more connections and I invite you to take full advantage of that opportunity. Specifically, I invite you to engage with the speakers and the other attendees in the chat of the Zoom. Please introduce yourselves, share your LinkedIn profile, say hello to your friends and make some new ones. And please ask questions of our speakers. We will try to address as many of those as possible during the interview. Also, please make sure your chat is set to address speakers and attendees. I want to thank our sponsors for without their support, we could not keep this free. I want to thank First Horizon Bank, Bufkin Baker, Four Roses Bourbon, the Fairlane Hotel, Tennessee Entertainment Commission, Lightning 100, Tennessee Brew Works, Moo TV, Jive Printing, Project Music, and Cushmaster's brand of CBD products. So let's get down to business. Today, we welcome back to the host seat, Kelly Richards. Kelly is a seasoned business development executive in digital media, especially in music tech, and a SWAT team strategist with a strong proven track record in identifying opportunities and driving a vision to life from concept to execution. She has established long-term trusted relationships with stakeholders across the ecosystem, including mainstream talent, content creators, media execs, tech innovators and leaders and brand execs and investors. As a super connector, she's curated an enviable network that at best affords her one degree of separation from virtually anyone in the space. Kelly started out as a young A&R executive at EMI Music and went on to launch and drive Apple's earliest initiatives in music and entertainment during her lengthy tenure there prior to launching her consulting practice. She's also been a talent producer on a myriad of award shows, private fundraiser events, and working with a cross-section of some of the biggest talent on the planet. As a multidisciplinary innovator, she spent decades envisioning, identifying, and unlocking the value of emerging technologies and corresponding new revenue streams for those at the convergence of tech, music, and entertainment, cross-pollinating people and opportunities to create mutual wins. She's fascinated by people and what they want, need, or don't know that they need yet. She gets involved with new business models, new innovations, and new alliances that create amazing and engaging experiences that inform, entertain, surprise, and delight consumers. She's also a trusted advisor to high achievers, typically out of tech or entertainment, who are looking to reinvent themselves around what matters most to them as they contemplate what's next. She holds an MBA and has been honored as the top 100 women of influence by Silicon Valley Business Journal. Welcome back, Kelly. So glad you're here. Thanks, Tom. And joining Kelly as today's featured guest is Lee Abrams. Lee is a legend in radio and media, having shaped and reinvented both for over five decades. He invented and built Album Rock, the first successful FM format. He also developed and launched XM Satellite Radio Program. His corporate clients have included every major broadcast group. He was XM Satellite Radio's chief programming officer, including joining XM as their first employee in June of 1998 to create Satellite Radio. Designing the programming, hiring and overseeing the training, a large staff with a mandate to reinvent the sound of radio. With 150 stations to develop and program, Lee was once again challenged to reinvigorate the radio landscape. He's passionate about the past, but focused on reimagining the future. Consultant to over 1,000 radio stations, 12 major print publications, and numerous TV stations and cable networks, several consumer products, 
Lee's other media projects have included the redesign of Rolling Stone magazine, the launch of NBC Source News Network, MTV, American marketing consultant to Swatch, Disney, and advisor to dozens of entertainment companies. Musically, his clients have included music industry pioneers such as the Moody Blues, Yes, Asia, Iron Maiden, Bob Seger, Island Records, and Capitol Records. He resides in Chicago and is a 9,000 hour commercial and instrument rated pilot, musician, and is currently writing Solutions for a creatively, creatively Starved Planet, which is the working title to be published in 2022. Please welcome these two amazing rock stars to the smartest people in the room. Take it away, Kelly. Thank you so much, Tom. Boy, after those intros, I feel like we can go right to questions. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, so Lee, let's start at the start. You know, you, you grew up in the Chicago area where you still live, right? Right. Tell our audience a bit uh, about what fueled your early passions for radio, which will ultimately be such a massive part of your career? Well, you know, I'll never forget. It was uh, December 10th, 1962. Uh, my parents got a radio for Christmas and gave it to me and I turned it on and WLS boomed in and I was just like, oh my God, I'd never heard anything like this. It was magical. Uh, not only the music, but the magic between the songs. And, it was just a transporting experience. So really a heavy radio fan. But then around 1965, uh, I was in junior high or something, and uh, managed a bunch of bands around the Chicago area. And all the bands played Little Latin Loopy Lou, Midnight Hour, and Louie Louie, and songs like that. We wondered, is this really what people want to hear? And so we did questionnaires outside of the sock hops and VFW halls, asking people who came to the shows, what would you like to hear next week? And an amazing thing happened. And that was that the top 40 audience was starting to fragment. The responses we got were mainly from guys 16 to 19, rejecting the top 40 hits of the day, which prior to that, everybody liked. Uh, but they were saying, we want the yard birds and the animals and the stones and the beetles and groups like that. So we thought, oh, okay. So the band started playing that and became very popular. But that movement, which wasn't known as a movement at the time, grew. So in 1966 and seven, if you knew who Hendrix or Clapton was, you were really in the know. 68, it got bigger and all hell broke loose in 1969 with a musical and cultural revolution. But you really couldn't hear this new music on the radio. I mean, there were underground stations, uh, you know, uh, playing this kind of music mainly at night. But uh, it wasn't, uh, wasn't in a, available on a mass level. So it created a radio format geared to reach what we call vulnerable top 40 listeners. And these are people who listen to top 40, loved it when Cream and Santana would come on, didn't really like it when, uh, in all due respect, a uh, Herb Albert came on or Gary Puckett and the Union Gap. So we designed a format aimed around these artists aimed at the vulnerable top 40 listeners, this huge amount of people who listened to top 40 but didn't really like it. And what we did was we changed the familiarity factor from song title to artist, whereas historically, radio ratings were based on familiar music where you knew every song. In this imagined format, you'd know every artist, uh, but within that artist, there was tremendous depth. And the result was like, oh damn, well that's Santana, but it's not Black Magic Woman again. And that's yeah. the Moody Blues, but it's not uh, Nights in White Satin. So we developed the format aimed at vulnerable top 40 listeners to be as commercial as possible without losing the progressive identity because it was deep, but focused on this new generation of artists and uh, launched it. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. But it uh, really all started with a passion for radio and music in 62. And then uh, the real uh, sort of... Uh, a gating point was around 65, where it really just got engaged in this well, sure. new movement. Sure. But you know, Lee, um, obviously you were a trend spotter because you started to pay attention to what was happening. Progressive rock was coming into the fore at that point. We weren't necessarily calling it that, but that's the pivot point, I think, where everything changed and all of a sudden you're playing whole album sides. And of course, this is the birth of FM radio and AOR, album-oriented rock. And 
it's not like it's past the salt. It's like where you weren't just lucky to come upon that trend. You really had to push things uphill to, to get it, you know, to scale. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, absolutely. There were some pivotal, pivotal moments. Um, uh, our first station was WQDR in Raleigh. And I was actually working at ABC at W programming WRIF in Detroit. And one day, uh, the afternoon guy at our sister station, WXYZ, comes to me and says, you know, I know this guy in Raleigh, North Carolina, and uh, he owns this Class C 100,000 watt FM. Would you have dinner with him if he flew to town? I said, sure. So we had dinner. I explained my concept, which is different from ABC's, which is also a great format. And um, he said, well, by dessert, we had a deal. I was going to turn his station in Raleigh to uh, album rock. And uh, so I went to Raleigh and uh, we put it on the air and it got huge ratings, like number one in 90 days. Of course, ABC found out because it got a lot of press and they were confused. And they basically said, well, um, you know, it's either us or them. And I saw this is a huge opportunity. So it was them and uh, signed another station. But then really, you know, I was 17 or 18 at the time and uh, didn't have the business sense to really develop this new format. So I hooked up with uh, Kent Burkhart, who was a very powerful uh, guy who had started a consultancy working with AM stations. And I said, Kent, you got the AMs, I got the FMs, let's go. And from there, it just you know took off once I had that uh, that partnered in the, in the business sense backing. Well, see, this is the power of being a true visionary, Lee. You're prescient. You were right on point, right on time, leading the edge. But, you know, beyond what you yourself did, what would you say was the cultural melting pot that enabled FM to take off in market at scale when it did and basically take over? Well, it was part of the whole cultural and social revolution that was going on. Uh, the zeitgeist know, in the air. Yeah, riots in the streets, sexual, sexual revolution, drug revolution, uh, just uh, moon landings, Vietnam, Martin Luther King, all that was happening all in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. And AM radio, which was dominant, was just out of sync. It didn't match the pulse of what was going on in America. And FM came along and uh, you know matched the vibe that the country was going through. And within five years or 10 years, FM completely reversed, uh, reversed the trend and became the dominant band. But and it was and all this, culturally this driven. All, yeah, sorry, this, this, is a, this is a hallmark of your, this is a through line we're gonna talk about throughout the whole discussion, is yeah. that you were on point with the fact that media was out of sync with where people were and the culture was, and you were gonna make a difference. We're gonna, this is gonna be a theme that gets repeated. Right, yeah, it was, uh, but the timing was just perfect, uh, you know, culturally. And, uh, you know, FM had been around since 1940 or so, but it really took amazing new content to uh, bring it to the forefront. And, and, and the vision, and the vision. I don't want to let go yeah. of that because really any monkey could have done it, but you're the one who really- yeah, I was the monkey, the I guess. <laughs> so subsequently, we're going to fast forward maybe, you know, a decade here, not quite, maybe five years, um, you were a part of the pioneering team that envisioned and delivered MTV to the world. And again, similar thread, gee, there's a, a zeitgeist in the consciousness. Share some highlights with us about what was going on that led to that pivotal sea change and your role in it. Well, I didn't really have, I mean, it was really Bob Pittman and Les Garland, those guys. I was, uh, you know, just joining the party and, uh, and giving them input. I think one of the reasons they hired me was so I wouldn't go, because we were very powerful at that time. We had hundreds of stations. Wouldn't go uh, to another company and start a competitive to, a competitor to MTV. But uh, it was the same sort of thing. Um, the timing was right. Uh, cable was just sort of where FM was in the late 60s. Uh, culturally and musically, there were new movements, the new wave movement particularly, that radio was kind of avoiding. Remember the K-Rocks and a few stations that were playing that music, but there was another perfect example of timing. Uh, cable was starting to happen. There was a new musical movement and uh, radio at that time was starting to get a, you know, a little, uh, a little uh, consolidated. 
And, uh, you know, they came on and just exploded it. And uh, one of the great things about MTV is they broke the rules. They did things you're not supposed to do in television from uh, their slogan to their visuals. To, uh, so they, they were similar to the early FM, just like uh, blowing up the playbook. And um, I love it. And, I love it. And, yeah, and was, you know, again, this is the dawn of cable. So what did they need? They needed content. And, exactly. You know, uh, that was that was it, and uh, that's been a, a, a theme throughout. There's all this new technology, but what it's missing is amazing content that matches the magic of the technology itself. And again, market timing can't underestimate that in, in terms of the right visionaries catching the wave and riding it all the way up. So exactly. you know, this is the magic that made MTV work when it did. I'm not sure you could do something like that again because you can't control all the elements would you agree with that or you know again factors had to come together in just the right way to enable it to flourish at that time could it be done well, again yeah uh, not on uh, mtv's been done uh fm's been done but in the dust of 2020 which is a lot like the late 60s i think there are tremendous opportunities that uh are similar to what fm did or what mtv did uh in other media so yeah, we're think... gonna we're gonna get there lee um i i that, that's the next phase of flow here <laughs> okay yeah and that's exciting. you that's you and your journey your legacy we're going to talk about those very specifically but i want to try to sort of get us to this point sure currently so let's stay in the wayback machine for a minute okay. <laughs> Excuse me. of course your next massive success came when you joined xm as its chief programming officer, its first employee to create, envision, and design what we now know as satellite radio, something that changed the driving experience for so many of us. To this day, I can't stand getting into a car without it and hearing commercials on the radio. Insufferable. What was your thinking in terms of that and designing the channels the way you did and the, the creative marketing strategy you worked out with the car manufacturers that resulted in mass adoption? It was a magic time, and again, perfect timing. Radio had taken its eye off the creative ball, become very consolidated, and, uh, and frankly, uh, on autopilot. And uh, the opportunity was so great, because we had a blank canvas to completely reinvent radio, to start all over, pretend that radio never existed before, what would it sound like? Then we hired amazing people uh, that had the aptitude for what we were going to do. Out of every hundred we interviewed, 99 didn't get it, but there'd be that one that did. And they were not necessarily from FM radio. Some came from uh, public television. Some came from record company. Came from, it was a melting pot of, of talent. Then we had what we called boot camps. Two years of intensive sessions that went several hours, uh, usually offsite in kind of cool places, where we unlearned everything people learned about radio and retaught them the XM way. And it sounds very, it's like, it was magical because we gave them, we liberated people. We gave them the opportunity to do radio for the reasons they got into it in the first place. It introduced totally new concepts in production, in music rotations. And uh, because of the boot camps, they really engaged in it. We even built a cliche buzzer. If somebody uh, comes up with a cliche, they get buzzed. Three buzzes, we were fired. So somebody would say, Hey, let's do a block party weekend. And eh, been done. Yeah. Nobody actually got fired, but they sure got the idea. And they gonna get dropped through a hole in the floor, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and then the management, the ownership was great in that they were from telecom. And our CEO at the time was from uh, cable television. And they really didn't have a radio agenda. And they were like, you know, we gotta build satellites, we gotta, you know, sell car companies, you deal with the programming. Uh, I mean, they obviously wouldn't let me go completely crazy, but that was pretty crazy. But I mean, and, to talk about that programming piece for a minute, because designing the channels the way you did, and were you were you just let loose, or was it you trying to optimize for certain audiences and demographics? Well, when, when I talked to them, it was like you know, it's, it's funny because they originally wanted to call it, you know, the channels Rock One, Rock Two, Country One, Country Two, and they actually referred to the, this proposed service as an audio service. I said, are you fucking kidding? This is a chance to create magical radio on a national scale. Just huge and beautiful and just, you know, a gorgeous sonic experience. We're not gonna be an audio service. 
So, hey, uh, you know, uh, Gary Parsons, the chairman of the company, said, yeah, okay, go for it. And we did. And uh, I mean, we engaged artists. We uh, got Bob Dylan to do a radio show. We engaged guys like Quincy Jones. We just blew up the playbook. And it was a, a magical time with magical people. I mean, they were, again, handpicked but, and trained, but really, uh, you know, got it. This is the reason why you and I get along so well, Lee, and we'll get to what we're doing in a little bit. But, you know, fellow visionaries ahead of the curve, breaking rules, reinventing paradigms, capitalizing on trends. This is what it takes to move the needle. And Absolutely. you've done it admirable, admirably and repeatedly. So it's not like it was an accident. It's not um, for the creatively meek. You know, you gotta... No, no, no. <laughs> and, 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 and what, just for people that don't know, talk for a minute about the business mini MBA case study about the creative marketing strategy with the audio ma auto manufacturers that resulted in this mass adoption of satellite. Like I, I didn't buy a car unless it had satellite in it in 2007. Yeah. Well, uh, the big uh, milestone was uh, General Motors invested heavily in, and as a result, put it in all their cars. And the, uh, the, the um, auto business, obviously very competitive. So once GM had it, well, Ford had to have it and so did Toyota and everybody else. So it was a domino effect. But um, once GM saw the tremendous response and the take rate, they were just like, uh, wow, this is the car of the future. And uh, that was a, just a huge, that, that was really a turning point when, uh, when we went into the cars. Because we had portable units, which were very cool. but. Um, it was the uh, the automotive that just drove it through the roof. It, pun intended. And then, of course, not just GM, but then it became a competitive differentiator. So the other yeah, guys had to come on board. Right. You know? And uh, people were demanding it at uh, car rental places. So Hertz and Avis and Nashville and all those guys had to uh, offer it as an option. And uh, it just, you know, the domino effect. It just... So they wanted their MTV and now they wanted their satellite radio. You know, it's an interesting point. With MTV and satellite radio, they didn't have users, they had fans. Right. And, trans, uh, and evolving a user into a fan is just critical in any, any media. And there's lots of users, and you can buy yourself users. But boy, creating fans, that's... That's, that's really the magic. That's really the magic that stands the test of time again. Now, I want to just step back a step to this sure. unlearning from a leadership standpoint of what you did in management with the with XM. Yes. Uh, and you can and you came up with all kinds of, you know, again, the unplaybook and the origin origin of say AFDI and some of these fabulous terms which are really <laughs> managerial principles. Tell people what AFDI means. Well, uh, pardon my language, it means actually fucking doing it. Um, and I'll go back to the history of that. That became a mantra at XM and I'll get to that in a sec but the roots of it go back to when I was a radio consultant and uh, went to a market and uh, they had a three share. They're in the ratings toilet. They had had eight shares and they were in trouble. So I suggested to the, uh, the management, let's get the program director, the manager, the sales manager, the engineer, all the key people and go to a hotel room and lock ourselves in the suite with a bunch of radios and just tear the thing apart, tear ourselves, tear the competitors apart. No denial, no just anything goes. And uh, encourage what we call the creative batting average. Come up with 100 ideas. If only 30 work, you're an all-star because you're batting 300. So nobody will remember the 70 that didn't. But anyway, we had that session, poured out of the hotel suite at four in the morning, loaded with legal pads. And I was a consultant. And so I went away for uh, several weeks and came back. When I came back, I was very excited. Said, so did we do those things we talked about? How about this? Well, no, we uh, threw some research at it and didn't, didn't look good. Okay, how about this one? Well, we had a committee meeting and uh, no, it just didn't pass. Okay, how about this one? Uh, home office would never let us do this one. How about this one? Oh, I forgot about that. Bottom line is they did nothing. The next rating book came out and they had a 2-5. And that's when I thought, God, AFDI actually fucking doing it is so critical. And at XM, primarily, AFDI, again, was a mantra in everything we did. It was, um, you know, I remember early on, very early on, there was a meeting with a lot of the marketing people and uh, we were talking about the proposed formats. And I said, well, we got to do a blues format. Well, why should we do a blues format? Just 
AFD high. Let's actually fucking do it. Blues is huge. Trust me. And, um, and you know, so it's, means, a, it's a cautionary tale for people that are in leadership and management. Oh, you know, yeah. So when you figure I mean, out who you want to hire, it, it's the one percenters that are AFDI are actually going to do it. Right. And then there's mission statements. You know, what's our mission? We don't need a mission statement. I remember going to a TV station when I was at Tribune and uh, walked into the front door and there was this mission statement uh, behind this, the receptionist. We uh, represent the community boldly. We are the leaders in the investigative journalism. We are inventors of new media. And I asked the sales manager, do you believe that stuff? He said, oh, hell no. If we did half of that, we'd be number one in the market. <laughs> so um, that's sort of a, a, a side note to FDI. <laughs> I love I love your ethos. It really is just so spot on. It just you just tell it like it is. Now, um, uh, of course, when we talk about I'm jumping around a bit, but sure. the format we talk about the creation of superstar artists, and both you and I have had the privilege of working closely with a lot of big artists. We talked to in the intro. Tom mentioned several, including Yes and Asia and Bob Seger, Moody Blues, Iron Maiden. What did you do with those guys that? was so memorable and impactful. Tell us a little bit about your role with them. Well, uh, it was different roles. Um, in the case of, uh, you know, very close to Yes, John Anderson was just a dear friend, one of my closest friends. Uh, and Chris Squire, rest in peace, was also very close. I dealt mostly with those two guys. Yeah. And it was just a lot of discussion. And uh, with Chris particularly, arguments, fierce arguments over... Uh, over the direction of the band. And uh, I think I provided the kind of input that they didn't get from the record companies or managers. Because I was half industry pundit and half super fan. And you put those two together and uh, it's really able to, um, to just communicate with them on a, on a higher level. And my goal was to just inspire them uh, mm -hmm. and to give them confidence and, uh, and uh, you know, help their vision. And, um, you know, they, they obviously write the songs they perform and they're, they're brilliant. Uh, but all I could do is just support them and, and give them as much input and reality check as possible. Well, and perhaps make them think a little differently, kind of like the role of a record producer. Yes. No, in the, right. In the case of an Iron Maiden, uh, Rod Smallwood, who's their manager, said, well, we're really not breaking in America it's like we should. And I did a huge 200-page report for him. Um, Iron Maiden in America, and they actually took it to heart, and they stayed broke in America. So that was more of a uh, a formal program. And yeah. Then, uh, worked with uh, Moody Blues. I worked with their record company primarily when they came back in the night in the mid uh, '80s on uh, how to you know break this band with a new keyboard player, kind of a new sound, and uh, worked closely with a, another late uh, person, Jim Lewis. And uh, you know, created strategies to help get them uh, just uh, uh, back on track. They had been, they had been mean, gone for years. Is there anything more fun than working directly in the middle of the creative process with artists? I don't think so. No, it's 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 incredible. That's why I look at media as media art. I like to work with media artists, and sometimes that's a bad word because people think, "Oh, media art. That's for arts and crafts. That'll get you nothing." But uh, art done well in media can drive commerce. And I think that's well, again, this is, again, you and I trip over each other in this piece from working with progressive, forward-thinking, tech-savvy artists who embraced MTV early on uh, as multidimensional, multimedia artists. Bowie, Prince, Todd Rundgren, Peter Gabriel, oh, right. all these guys. You media know? can be an art form. Yeah. Uh, it should be. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, it's really not, but it should be and can be. So beyond your roles now with radio and MTV and everything else we just talked about, you also have been a, a highly sought after consultant on a number of consumer and media brand projects, including Swatch and Radio Disney and others. So I'd love for you to just share a couple anecdotes or stories about that time in your life. Favorite client, project, your role of redesigning Rolling Stone magazine? Yeah, Rolling Stone. Uh, I had met with uh, Jan Wenner and a guy named Kent Brownridge. And, um, you know, that was, uh, it's like Rolling Stone was kind of perceived in a, in a, in a 60s way, not reaching their, their, their potential, uh, just losing a little of the charm. 
So that was actually a research project. I went out and talked to every imaginable uh, Rolling Stones user and, or fan, whatever, and former reader, and uh, just really painted a picture of what the Rolling Stone reader is all about, what they're wanting. And there were several things you know discovered. They really weren't into 10 page articles on the political impact of uh, you know the tsetse fly invasion in Thailand. Uh, they're more you know about let's hear about Springsteen. And their covers also sometimes were a little esoteric and they needed to put again, a guy like Bruce Springsteen on the cover. And um, it really, I think it pissed off a lot of their writers because it was very blatantly truthful. And I remember doing a presentation to present the, uh, the information to them. And half of them were like, uh, very, eh. another half were like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And so that was a, a great project, which was sort of tied to the hip with what we were doing in radio, because it's kind of the same audience. And- uh, as, just, as the audience aged, you needed to yes. stay in tune with them. Right, and they had a habit of uh, taking a lot of artists and uh, bad-mouthing them. Uh, you know, it's like certain bands like Rush, you know, they couldn't get a good review, but the Gang of Four would get, you know, four stars. So it's just giving a little reality check, which I think they took a lot of that advice to heart. Not all of it, but uh, enough to I think, make a difference. I'm curious, I'm curiously, what do you think this, as a quick side note, what do you think the secret sauce was for, you know, David Fricke and all these guys to be there forever? Why, hey. What kept them there? What kept these great writers there for decades? No, I think just great writers. Uh, you know, they could take a topic and spin it in the language of the culture. And, uh, you know, it was uh, bottom line, very clear, just great writing. And, and, and eventually really good topics. I think they missed the topics for a while and got a little too, I don't know, political. And, uh, but once they mainstream the uh, topics a little bit without losing their edge, that's when the, the writing really shone. Um, and how about, how about Swatch, for example, or Radio Disney? Tell us a story about one or those guys. What yeah, Swatch was uh, also, they were um, big in Europe and just entering the American market. And what I did was, uh, like with Rolling Stone, painted a picture of the American consumer. Uh, I think if there was anything, they were a bit too artsy in the, in the kind of New York way, Greenwich Village way. And I tried to uh, present to them more of the American point of view. Right. Uh, they were very, again, the New York, LA culture, we tried to expand. And there was also St. Louis and Chicago and Detroit. And uh, that was the focus of it. And um, they, again, were, were watch people. They were media people. And uh, they listened to a lot of it. And, uh, you know, I think it became a, a real popular brand. Radio Disney was, um, that was fun. Uh, I had young kids at the time. And uh, they weren't um, really uh, listening to radio. Uh, they could have, because they were in the car a whole a lot and uh, actually presented the idea of a children's format to David Cantor, who was the CEO of, um, of Satellite Music Network, which was later ABC, later Disney. And he loved the idea because he had kids too. And so we created, uh, went to LA and created a bunch of demos. And uh, at that time it was owned by ABC. They, uh, they really bought into the idea. And again, Disney, it started as an ABC project then when Disney acquired our company, uh, they said, well, this is Radio Disney. And uh, that was great because that also uh, brought in a whole new generation of people who hadn't been, um, you know, conditioned by the radio rules. Well, again, and, the younger demo that was going to yeah. be the next wave of the population, right? That was a, a real younger demo. And uh, it was great because... Uh, Again, there were uh, non-radio people involved or radio people who were just out of their element, focusing at uh, young and inspired a lot of new ideas and weren't tied down by the radio rule book. So that was a that was a fun project. Yeah, Unfortunately, they uh, they didn't really uh, they went out of business just recently after a long run. Right. Uh, what, what happened was, I think, is uh, the original view, uh, listeners didn't uh, really grow up with them. And, and the new listeners were more into their uh, devices than the radio. 
And so they were left a lot of ex listeners. But for exactly. a period of time there, it was uh, exactly it was great. Well, that's that's so cool. I mean, such breadth in your career, truly. But now we've talked a lot about the past. I want to fast forward to the present in your role as Chief Visionary Officer and Creative Architect for Lee Abrams Media Visions, which is all about aggressively reimagining and executing on storytelling and new approaches that define media and fan engagement in the 21st century. In particular, I'd like to do a bit of a deep dive into three discrete projects that we're actually working on together for transparency. Um, news movie, Radio Free Earth, and Sonic Messengers. So let's talk to the folks about what uh, high level, what's happening with each of those projects. Okay, News Movie uh, is a, a complete dramatic reinvention of television news. But I mean, it completely blows up the playbook. And for the first time, in all due respect to journalists, this is created from a programming point of view. Obviously, the the uh, the channel will have you know teamy with with journalists, but the actual architecture is being designed by myself from a programming point of view. And I think the timing is so right because it's another period of cultural, social, technological revolution like we saw in the late '60s. But uh, news is where AM radio was in 1969. It's just painfully dated. Uh, they're operating off some 70s, 80s focus group hell. And um, the attitude- Right, right with cliches and strange oh, images. Oh, you know, no, not, yeah. you know, just like uh, crazy. And uh, there is such an opportunity to be in sync with the era. And that means a totally blowing up the playbook. Because right now, it's so cliche two chit-chatting anchors in front of a fake city skyline on cable news, you know, eight people yelling at each other with a lower third that's just cluttering. It's, it makes you nervous. So this uh, concept is, um, again, much like, you know, in a way like FM was in 1970, uh, but it's news. And um, it's all about information is the new rock and roll. In all due respect to rock and roll, yeah. What's really driving the culture is information. Instead of a Walkman, we, we have our devices. And uh, this is really a rock and roll type project, which you know, isn't gonna be heavy metal in your face, but takes a lot of the uh, characteristics of rock and roll thinking, that innovation, that strive to be, striving to be different and applying it to news for an electric, in your face, beautiful, uh, experience of information. We call it news movie because it's a movie of the world at the moment. It's not anchors anchored. It's just a magical experience that takes you to the stories. And there's three characteristics we like to, to use to define it. Eye, ear, brain. And it's eye is where it's visually stunning. Again, it's cinematic in nature. There's just beautiful pictures of the world at the moment. Even, even war scenes can be in their own cinematic way, beautiful. Ear, every story will have a soundtrack which elevates the storytelling immensely. If it's a story about the inner city, it might be Coltrane type music or a story about tornadoes in Texas, maybe it's Willie Nelson sort of music. So it's got a sonic quality to it. And brain, now if you picture what we call an intellectual scale, if one in television is you know, honey boo boo, and 10 is masterpiece theater. This resides at about a seven. It's not elite or too hip for the room. It's not dumb. It, I think the golden, the, the magical zone is that seven where it's again intelligent, but again, not elite or not, not dumb. So I hear brain and it, it transports you to the story because of the visuals and the sounds. We don't report, we transport. And a line we like to use is high IQ, low BS, meaning it is higher IQ, it's smart, but low bullshit, no, uh, you know, tonight at 10, uh, the news starts now, I mean, it's none of that crazy stuff. <laughs> I call it mass appeal intelligence. Well, and, and also, you know, like what we're doing right now uh, on, on the Zoom split screen chat, you can be watching three different things going on, four different things going on around the world uh, in real time and zoom in and hear what's going on. I mean, oh. I don't know this isn't happening anywhere else. Inter interactivity is an important component to it. And, uh, you know, it would never happen on uh, 
on terrestrial television. It's made for a streaming service. Uh, you know, I mean, a Netflix would be great. Call it Newsflix, but you know, uh, it's uh, it's really really different, and uh, I think it'll engage a lot of people on the younger end, the uh, sixteen to you know forty, who find traditional news just you know it's their parents' news. It's old. It's tired. Exactly. You know? This is electric. Just to be clear, with all three projects we're going to talk about, there is an opportunity. We're actively talking to media companies and uh, people that want to get involved with us to get these projects off the ground. So as we go through each of them, you know, if anybody has thoughts, we, we're all ears. Let's let's move to Radio Free Earth for a few minutes, please. Yeah, Radio Free Earth is all the things I'm, uh, I'm ranting on about radio actually uh, designed into a format. Uh, some of the key characteristics of it, it is aimed a little older, 40 plus. Uh, it's really expertly programmed music that's deep and very addictive. It's conducive to environmental listening, uh, where you can listen in the background or you can listen foreground. Its presenters will be very conversational musical experts that walk you through the experience. And they won't talk too much or you know, it won't be a talk station, but They'll create a uh, you know that personality edge that's missing in radio today. Very important is magic between the songs, theater of the mind production, uh, production that uses everything from foreign accents to thunderstorms to uh, orchestral music to whatever it takes to create a an audio picture that's long been missing from radio. A uh, new generation of features, you know, we joke about uh, stations using two for Tuesday and block party weekends and all these. 50 year old uh, cliches. This will have a whole new generation of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of trademarks, uh, franchises, and a real connection with the music uh, community. Uh, a lot of, uh, like we did at XM, we had Artist Confidential and Artist to Artist, a whole new generation of those that really engage the, uh, the artists on a, on a level of, uh, you don't know, hear on radio, maybe a little bit exactly. on satellite. But uh, again, you know, with that rich programming ethos, that is a hallmark of what you were doing with XM and FM, and you know, yes. niche, niche channels. In many respects, this will be similar to the same vibe as freeform radio had in the late '60s, but with today's discipline and the realities of 2021. But it'll have that that feel where you know anything can happen. And uh, it's interesting that when I first we first did the superstars for AOR for rock format. Uh, the, the important thing was discipline, you know, because these progressive stations, you know, and I love those stations, but they were kind of all over the place. It was raining, you'd hear rain songs. And that, that was fine. They had their place. But our, our place was more of a disciplined approach. Now it's 180 degrees. It's too disciplined. So we're all about is opening it up and bringing back, letting the stations breathe again. And, 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 and why, Lee, do you think it's so important? Why do you think it's necessary? that we re-architect news and radio in the 21st century, uh, where audiences are hungry and even starved for this, even if they don't know what's possible. Oh, well, again, it's timing, you know, coming off of the, uh, the era we're in, which the world's having a nervous breakdown. So it's good timing and opportunity. Again, in television news, it's, it's just based on the 80s. It has no relevance today. And radio is the same way. It's ever since consolidation, you know, it's on creative autopilot. Uh, and you know, I remember when I was a kid, you'd drive, uh, we'd drive for vacation from Chicago to Florida, and we'd pass through Indianapolis, Louisville, Nashville, Atlanta, Jacksonville, and get to Miami. And every station sounded the same. It had character, ooze their city. Now you make that same trip, and it's like one station, one voice, one production style, and there's just a tremendous opportunity. To create something that um, that is just big and connects. Well, and if I might history. say, it's an opportunity for big media companies and tech companies who are embracing content to reinvent themselves and, and add in this slice as a differentiator versus their competitors. Yeah, you know, it's interesting that um, uh, there are many opportunities with new technologies, whether uh, streaming. Because right now, a lot of them are jukeboxes. And that's great. Now I listen to Pandora, uh, you know, Pandora and Spotify and Apple and all that. But the radio experience done right, which has nothing to do with the way it's being done now, can take it to a whole new level. So I, I'm hopeful that we can 
place it at uh, at one of those kind of companies. That, that is what uh, we are actively working on. But yes. let's go back to Sonic Messengers. That's the one other project I really wanted us to touch on for a minute that we haven't yet. Yes, Sonic Messengers. This is a story that needs to be told. It's a documentary. Uh, we have a, a partnership with uh, Spencer Proffer, who a lot of you guys know, and we found a great editor and producer, but the story is really amazing. It, uh, it starts with the really, you know, uh, post-World War II when you had guys like Steve Allen on the air, and then it goes into Top 40 radio and the transistor radio and the birth of Top 40, and then it, it, it travels you, it takes you on a trip through the early 60s where the big new top 40 stations are emerging, the WABCs and the, um, and the WLSs. And then it goes into the middle 60s with the KHJ uh, for you in radio, the Drake Revolution, then underground radio, and then the alternative radio and AOR. And it's a time trip from World War II to the present that tells the story of how music and radio work together to change the American culture. And it's really and it's not effectively for, the only documentary I'm aware of that's ever been done on radio, uh, in, the way we're talking about it. It becomes a series potentially as well. And it yes. has other ancillary pieces, coffee table book, what have you. But yeah, what I really yeah. love about it, Lee, is that it not only covers those those um, time gaps, uh, you know, the, over the decades of radio's evolution. It also mirrors what was happening culturally, what was happening with technology. How did very the much so. How did I mean, engagement change? Yeah, uh, you know, the, there were so many major, we had the post-World War II era and the, the Kennedy assassination and the craziness of the late 60s and the Iran crisis, all these things tied in and how radio and music helped tell the story. Because radio really was the soundtrack of America. There was nothing yeah. more American, nothing cooler than driving down the freeway 80 miles an hour radio cry to a great station you get chills and we want to re uh, recreate that experience in documentary form well, it's, it's an homage it's an homage and frankly with i dare say without radio for decades how would how would audiences have been exposed to all the music we've come to love oh absolutely yeah. and uh and it's again as you mentioned it's never been told before and it's not for radio geeks it's a mass appeal story that everybody relates to pop culture yeah, it's pop culture at its, at its peak, and it uh, it's something everybody can relate to. Uh, it's just part of the American experience that uh, needs to be story that needs to be told. Well, I say, I'm I'm very honored to be working with you on all of these projects. They're they're e they're equally fun and important for us to you know get out there and make happen. So again, we're open if anybody wants to reach out to us later to have those conversations. Now, you know, there's there's one other project. Yeah, go ahead. Working. Sorry, Lee. Uh, I'm working with I can't name the, the people but a major record producer and a god of special effects in video that you know both their names and it's premature to talk about it but it is a complete reimagination of the concert experience it will take over where the pink floyds left off um it is again i ear brain it will be visually just mesmerizing sonically just chilling and again, it's a thinking person's event. This is not a Slayer concert. This is, you know, <laughs> on a much higher level. And I really think with the team we've put together, and when you hear who they are, you'll, you'll get it. Uh, it's going to be an extravaganza, a tour de force that uh, redefines the live music experience. And it'll be ready probably late next year, maybe early 2022. And it'll be at a... Um, a residency, it uh, will eventually tour, but uh, it's so complex with the technology. It's heavily technical, technology driven that um, it needs to be at least initially a residency, but it's gonna, it's gonna do to the concert experience what 2001 did to uh, science fiction. So, well, so uh, uh, I, wanna, yeah. I wanna go to questions, Lee. Uh, we have a couple and we, and we have time for a few here. Uh, Great. Before we do, I just wanna ask you one last thing, which is of all the many things you've created and envisioned and worked on or are now poised to reinvent the future of media yet again, what would you most like to be rem remembered for in terms of the impact you've had in your overall legacy? Well, I think uh, <laughs> two answers, one, I don't think it's happened yet. I think it's one of these projects we're talking about that's going to really be the long term. 
Uh, but if, if you know, everything ended today, you know, XM was really special uh, just because of the, the impact it had and uh, the reach and how the company is, uh, you know, people will, will bad rap satellite radio, but I think it's the most profitable radio company in the world. And, and I'm a big fan, even though it's changed a lot. But uh, Howard Stern just, owes, owes his whole career over the past you know, 15, 20 years to you. Well, we gave him, me and uh, Dwight Douglas, my partner at, uh, at uh, Burkhardt Abrams, our consulting company, were very influential in bringing him into, into markets when he was an unknown. Indeed. Well, let's take a couple questions, Lee. Um, you know, a, an anonymous person says, what's Lee's take on the claims that he ruined FM radio by using data to put a box around the formats, constraining G DJs to a formula? How does he view terrestrial radio today? I think it's lacking a soul and disjointed. Yes. Uh, first answer is, you know, uh, we were never out to uh, destroy uh, progressive radio or freeform radio. We just had our thing. And these stations became very popular. As I mentioned earlier, uh, or I may not have mentioned, the, uh, uh, the target was the vulnerable top 40 listener. And this was the person who, you know, their musical spectrum was not, they weren't in the uh, fusion. They weren't into necessarily the mothers of invention. They were into that stadium rock. Yeah. And I think we provided a great service for them. And if people didn't like it, they wouldn't have listened, but people listened in huge numbers. And uh, again, it wasn't, uh, oh, we're gonna ruin freeform radio. But uh, at that time it needed discipline. It needed a, a certain consistency because FM radio still hadn't been proven. And, um, and you know, again, it worked. So uh, I don't Can't know- Can argue with success, uh, right? Can argue yeah, with success. I mean, it was, again, I, 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 it wasn't my taste. I was into, you know, 20 minute yes songs, King Crimson and uh, Mothers of Invention. But, you know, we saw this, this target and, uh, you know, we went after it and it worked. I think radio today is, is horrible. It's on creative autopilot. And as I mentioned earlier, back then the need was for discipline because our, our target, our, our customer was the radio station yeah. that we, we consulted. We had to provide them ratings that they could sell. Did that very effectively with a disciplined approach. Now it's 180 degrees from that. It's too disciplined. Exactly. It's over research. It's just horrible. It's on creative autopilot at a time when radio should be, you know, realizing the com competition from satellite and from streaming and mediums that haven't been, uh, technologies that haven't emerged yet. It's paramount for stations to be on creative steroids, and they're not. So that's why I mentioned earlier the proposed format we're talking about is really uh, reminiscent of freeform, uh, not the superstars format, but reminiscent of freeform radio because that sort of approach will work today, whereas on a mass appeal basis, it didn't really work that well back then, even though it had a very- I, li I, like, uh, I like this comment from Michelle Schock. She says, consolidated corporate radio today are pinball wizards playing a tilted machine. Yeah, it's- uh, <laughs> I understand the financial st uh, stresses and all that, but it's not about money. It's about brain power. Yeah. It's about creating magic, thinking, creating new ideas, and doing what we did at XM, which was the, uh, you know, the the, the uh, 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 painting that hadn't been painted yet. Creating that, it's. I am very bullish on radio, whether it's on uh, on a streaming platform or if anybody ever gets it together on FM, because the radio experience can be awesome. It's not right now, it's a creative Well, like, we have another question that's a little bit off in a different direction, but I might as well throw it in. Uh, when and how were you first introduced to Toronto-based psychologist and researcher, Dr. John Paracol, and how influential and important was his work to your 20th century radio concepts and subsequent success? Yeah, uh, funny story is, um, it was, I was hired uh, by uh, Alan Slate, who was a uh, uh, Canadian, um, you know, multimillionaire type. He had bought Q107 in Toronto and hired us. And I landed in Toronto uh, on my first trip and John Paracol and Dave Charles picked me up at the airport. And, uh, you know, I was asking about Toronto and, uh, you know, I actually asked the question, is anybody here, uh, people in Toronto, get high? They said, well, yeah, do you? I said, well, maybe. 
oh great, they pulled out all these joints and we got so stoned and we hung out at the Plaza Two Hotel and had a really a 12 hour brainstorm session that really set the station in motion. So that's when I first met John, we had become friends and still are. And uh, it was a good balance. He had the, uh, I was very, uh, you know, very mechanical and uh, very uh, theory oriented. He was very McLe uh, McLuhan. And so it was a great balance. I wouldn't say his work really influenced me uh, as I don't think my stuff really influenced him, but together it was very powerful. And we actually hired him as sort of a, an advisor, a social cultural advisor at Burkhard Abrams. And um, he, was, he just brought a whole new dimension to, uh, to our thinking and to our clients' thinking. I think so, it's really uh, important to surround yourself with bright people that can yeah, challenge you. He was one, right? he still is. Yeah. It's incredibly smart. And what I loved about him is um, that he came from a different perspective. And some of his ideas were like ridiculous. Some of them were like interesting. Some of them were brilliant. And uh, sort of like a creative batting average. He was batting 300. 30% of his ideas and concepts were, were brilliant. So uh, that's how I met him and, and remained friends and very valuable component to our consultancy. I love it. We have one last question before we start to wrap up. And, and somebody says, when are you going to write a book with all your life stories? Now, I don't even know a lot about your book that's coming out next year, The Solutions for a Creatively Starved Planet. Does it? Surely that incorporates a number of your stories. Oh, yeah. Uh, and that'll hopefully be out late next year. i uh, been working on it constantly. And I do urge everybody to go to my website because there's so much there. I was just uh, about to pitch that at the end, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, uh, the short version of it, you can go to Lee Abrams, L-E-E-A-B-R-A-M-S dot rocks, like rocks, and it'll take you there. Uh, the other address is leeabramsmediavisions.com. But go to leeabrams.rocks and it'll take you there. And again, I encourage you to spend time on it. It's, it, it becomes like a <laughs> rabbit hole. Uh, fair warning for anybody who does go through it. There, it's chock full of all manner of blogs and Lee's ethos and all the projects that we've been discussing and everything. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, check it out. I think you'll enjoy it. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you, Lee, for your time, uh, and I want to thank all of our attendees for listening, the ones that were with us live and the ones that may watch this in the future. Uh, it's always great to be part of this series with Tom, and uh, I think that's everything for today, unless Tom wants to wrap it up. Yeah, I'll jump in here. Just let me say, marvelous job, Kelly, driving this interview, and Lee, this has been mesmerizing. You've got a lot of new fans today, and the three projects that you guys are working together on, I can't wait. Every, all three of them sound really interesting, right in my sweet spot. So please right. keep doing it. And, and what was the, um, what was the moniker earlier? Uh, AFDI. 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 Please, please do that. Okay. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> To the audience, thank you for your attention and supporting this platform. We love what we're doing here. We're going to keep doing it. We'll be back here next Tuesday with a couple more rock stars. And with that, I just want to sign off with the final word of get a shot and be nice to each other. Love it. Take, thank take you, care. Great. Thanks, thank everyone. You.